Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, afternoon panel. Uh, my name is Christian Svammer. I am the DPO uh, of the Danish National Police and also of our Passenger Information Unit and head of our Center for Data Protection uh, in, in Copenhagen. Um, welcome to this panel, as I said, uh, on end-to-end -end encryption uh, struck between a rock and a hard place. So just like the title says, this is one of those hard issues that has uh, been plaguing uh, the privacy slash security uh, field for decades. Um, but today we are going to solve it uh, once and for all. Um, no, maybe not, but at least we're going to talk to some uh, absolute key experts and policymakers uh, and civil servants that will help us get some nuances, hopefully, to what's always been a, uh, a somewhat fraught and binary debate where you uh, either believe in one side or the other. Uh, we want to nuance it and uh, and add some context. And uh, to help me do that is a uh, distinguished panel uh, of experts that I will uh, briefly introduce before giving them all a chance to to speak on on the issue uh, beforehand uh, before us, which is of course the the tension, if you will, on the one hand of uh, the interest of ensuring uh, consumer and individual privacy through the use of end-to-end -end encryption, encryption in a broader sense, and the dilemma that is created when uh, valid legal requests from law enforcement or uh, intelligence services uh, can no longer be uh, complied with or can only very difficultly be complied with um, and ensure that they can access content data, for instance, that is necessary to investigate and prevent uh, serious crime, terrorism, and threats to national security. Um, but we will get much more into detail as we go through the panel. I will start from the top. Um, first of all, we have Mr. Uh, Scott Charney. He's the Vice President for Security Policy at Microsoft, working with public and private sector organizations to develop and implement strategies to help secure the IT ecosystem. He currently serves as Vice Chair of the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee, He's a member of the Enduring Security Framework and is chair of the board uh, of the Global Cyber Alliance. Furthermore, we have um, uh, Mrs. Susan Landau. She is a British professor in the Fletcher School and Turf School of Engineering uh, at the Department of Computer Science at Turf University. Her new book, People Count, Contact Tracing Apps and Public Health, will be published by MIT Press in April 2021. She has also written several books on wiretap and encryption policy. Landau has testified before Congress and briefed the US and European policymakers on encryption, surveillance, and cybersecurity issues. Landau has been a CIVA staff privacy analyst at Google, a distinguished engineering uh, uh, engineer at Sun Microsystems, and a faculty member at Worcester Polytechnic Institute at the University of Massachusetts. And furthermore, we have Christine Rudigar. She is a senior director uh, Internet Trust at the Internet Society. She leads the Internet Society's policy agenda on Internet Trust, engaging with policy, enforcement standards, and operational communities where important work on Internet Trust issues is happening. She's actively engaged in global and regional Internet policy development and international and regional fora, such as the OECD, APEC, Council of Europe, and the Global Conference on Cyberspace. She works as a lawyer for the Australian, she's previously worked as a lawyer for the Australian government uh, a, within a, a variety of areas, principally in competition and consumer protection law, but also in administrative law, taxation, privacy, and freedom of information law. And finally, Catherine Bauer Bost is head of unit for the fight against cybercrime and child sexual abuse in DG Migration and Home Affairs of the European Commission. Her unit develops legislative proposals and policy and coordinates EU efforts in these areas, playing a leading role in the current negotiations of international instruments on cybercrime, such as the second additional protocol to the Budapest Convention uh, and the new e UN process. Right, so I will kick off with uh, Mr. Charney and, and, and put the question to you, Scott. Um, so as, as outlined in, in, in the program, um, there is a, there's a clear dilemma here, but take us into some of the practical issues that, based on your experience, the, this, this conflict gives rise to. 
Yes, thank you, Christian. And I, I should note, you know, in, in a prior life, I was at the U.S. Justice Department and involved in the Clipper debate and encryption debates of the 90s. So as you said, this is not a new problem, um, but it has taken on increased urgency as everyone goes digital and more and more evidence is online. And, you know, the challenge of encryption, I think, is well understood. It protects security and privacy but it also prevents law enforcement from getting access to plain text, even if that access is lawful, lawfully authorized, for example, by a warrant. Um, and this has led those in the law enforcement community to term it as going dark, that they're losing visibility into key evidence. Um, with that in mind, many, particularly policymakers, have looked for a compromise or middle ground. You know, when you have opposing views on a problem, uh, the hope is always that you can find some way to appease to some extent and annoy both ends of the spectrum and find a solution. But it's important to note in this context of encryption, it doesn't work. Um, and that's because encryption is binary. Things are either fully end-to-end -end encrypted so that only the creator, the encryptor, sender and recipient can see the text, or it's not. And um, it's engineered to provide third party access that the creator or sender did not uh, approve and authorize. And so when you actually look at people who are proposing a middle ground, it turns out what they're really suggesting is we should be able to access plain text and we should discuss how and when that should happen with what safeguards. And from a technology perspective, that's not the middle ground because you've already decided that access to plain text and true end-to-end -end encryption is um, not going to be preserved. Um, and this leaves everyone stuck with a binary decision. It's either to allow true end-to-end -end encryption or not. And this is why the panel's title, I think, is so great. We are really stuck between a rock and a hard place. And I think this is reflected by the fact that even in a single government, you can get conflicting points of view. You can get um, privacy authorities saying data has to be end-to-end -end encrypted and technology needs to provide that as a service to protect privacy. And at the same time, the same government, but a different part, the law enforcement community, can be espousing the view that they need some sort of lawful access. Um, so where does that leave us practically? And I think that is the real challenge. And I think, for me at least, to have been someone who's been in the computer security area since 1990, roughly, um, the reality is that protecting data is very, very difficult, um, in part because of the complexity of systems and vulnerabilities of systems, and in part because of the increased sophistication of adversaries. And recognizing that, I think that engineering weaknesses into encrypted systems is a very poor solution, because essentially what you're doing is weakening um, privacy and security for all users because you have an interest in some subset of users. And so if that's the wrong trade-off, then the question has to be, okay, uh, what next? And I think the answer has to be that we do want effective law enforcement. We do want public safety protected, but we have to find ways to do that in what will be an increasingly encrypted world. And that is a challenge in and of itself, but I think that's where people have to focus attention. Excellent, thank you very much. And we will definitely get back to you, Scott, on, on as we try to dive into some, some possible solutions. They may still be binary in some sense, but uh, how, how can we find a middle ground or at least acceptable solutions? Just before we move on to, to Professor Landau, I just wanted to, to quote a little bit that I think illustrates the point that Scott just made about how 
different parts of government can have uh, many different views or uh, and and how that sometimes leads to someone having to straddle the uh, a difficult position uh, the european commission recently uh, proposed a new network information security directive and in preamble uh, paragraph 54 of that proposal uh, the following is is stated the use of end-to-end -end encryption should be reconciled with the member states' powers to ensure the protection of their essential security interests and public security, and to permit the investigation, detection, and prosecution of criminal offenses in compliance with union law. Solutions for lawful access to information in end-to-end -end encrypted communications should maintain the effectiveness of encryption in protecting privacy and security of communications while providing an effective response to crime. Uh, not sure there's any solutions in that text, uh, just a, an outline of what the, the purpose of our panel is to discuss, but maybe when we get to uh, our commission representative at the end, uh, uh, Catherine will give us some insight into how this will be done going forward. But Susan, uh, Professor Landau, I, I will leave the word to, to you first. Um, so we'll go over to uh, Professor Landau uh, for her opening remarks. Thank you. And I'll say that I've also been debating this issue for about 25 years, in fact, but my first effort in this was working with Scott on a report for the Association of Computing Machinery. And it's surprising how little the policy debate has, has moved. Uh, when we talk about the encryption debate, what we need to realize is we're not talking about a security versus privacy debate. We're really talking about a security versus security debate. We're talking about economic security, the, the national security that comes from, ne uh, from economic security. We're talking about privacy. We're talking about securing people's data versus uh, the public safety issue. And that's where the, 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 the problem lies. I was recently on a Carnegie Endowment for International Peace study on moving the encryption policy debate forward. And it's worth discussing a little of where we got to in that discussion. Uh, we were a group of, in part, uh, members of uh, people who had been in the government under the Obama administration. Uh, this included a former National uh, Security Agency deputy director, uh, a former CIA deputy director. Some of those people have moved on into the Biden administration, so the director of national intelligence from, is now uh, is a member of that committee. Uh, we also had people from civil society and we had people from the industry. And we said, we're going to throw out two straw men. We're going to say that maybe there is a solution, not necessarily for end-to-end -end encryption, but for locking devices. Maybe there is a way that we can have secure devices, but still enable law enforcement. We won't say that, that there is one, but we'll say research can continue. There's no problem with doing research. We'll also throw out as a straw man the idea that uh, under no circumstances, uh, if, if law enforcement can't access encryption, um, then encrypted communications, encrypted data, then law enforcement can't do investigations. We'll throw those straw men out. And we'll also, at the same time, uh, say that there's certain values we need to preserve, including we don't want any solution to result in mass surveillance. There were others, and I urge you to read the report. But where we came down to was the issue. The issue, at least in the United States, is not that foreign intelligence is having a problem. I was on a National Academy study about four years ago, and at that time, the former the deputy director of the NSA came to brief us, and he said, well, foreign intelligence is growing dimmer. It's not growing dim. It's not growing dark. It's growing a little bit dimmer. Foreign intelligence is not where the problem is with encryption. Where the problem is with encryption is for law enforcement. So on the Carnegie report, we said we're going to focus on law enforcement. We also said we're not going to look at end-to-end -end encryption in large part because of the things that Scott was saying. Namely, if you, if you make a way to get into an end-to-end -end encrypted system, it's no longer a secure system. But part of it was also that if you do that, you do away with what's called forward secrecy, allowing each message to be encrypted with a different key, which makes breaking the whole system much harder. So we, we said we would look at steaded devices, and because we were interested in, in not having a solution that allowed mass surveillance, we said the device actually has to be in the hand of law enforcement. And then we asked the question, is there a solution 
that can unlock devices when law enforcement has it, yet keep phones secure for people in general. And if there isn't such a solution, then there shouldn't be a law. In other words, we said, first see if there's a good technical solution before you legislate, before you introduce policy. From there, uh, so we published our report and I am have some hope that it will be heard by the current administration, uh, in part because um, it's not dogged the way the other one appeared to be on the issue of encryption. But the other thing that came out recently, and it came from one of the members of our committee, who then with his civil society organization, decided to study the issue of, of when can law enforcement get into devices. And they discovered that 2,000 of the largest 18, uh, 2,000 of the 18,000 police forces in the United States, the United States has 18,000 police forces because we have state, local, federal, and tribal. Some police forces are very small, some of them are quite large. 2,000 of the 18,000 employed devices that allowed them to open phones and get data off. And this included 50 of the largest police forces. In other words, the vast number of police have the ability to get at data on the phones, locked phones. And we and Upturn also discovered that there were very few regulations regarding the use of, of the data, getting the, the data. They were not particularized searches. In fact, the tools are extremely sophisticated. So the tools would allow somebody to show a photo to the device and then say, is, any, is someone, uh, do you have a photo anywhere on the device of this person? Or give it a text and say, a piece of text and say, is that text anywhere on the, uh, in, in, on the device, in, in a stored document, in an email, in a text message? Very powerful devices, and yet they were poorly regulated. So I agree with Scott on the issue that we need to have a police force that's technically apt and technically able. But we also, of course, and I don't think Scott would disagree with me there, I don't think any of the panelists would, we need to have a police force that, uh, that is regulated in its use. And let me just say one final point, which is we also need, whether we're looking at child porn or other cases, we need to look at what are the most important cases and how do you investigate those? Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Uh, uh, before, before we go on to, to, to Christine, let me just help the audience to please uh, post your questions uh, um, on the right hand side of the, the panel screen, and uh, we will make sure to go through them uh, as many as we can as we progress. But I will now leave the, the, um, the floor to, uh, to Christine Runegar for her opening remarks. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, Microsoft, for organizing this really uh, interesting panel. It's great to be following Scott and Susan. So let me start with some sort of context um, for our thinking. So at the Internet Society, our vision is an Internet for, for everyone, an Internet that is open, globally connected, secure and trustworthy for all users. And encryption enables users to communicate confidentially, know who they're communicating with, and know that the information has not been altered in transit. We believe that the most effective way to ensure the personal security of billions online is to preserve strong, uncompromised encryption, including both end-to-end -end and user-controlled encryption. Now, as part of our efforts to actually make the internet more secure for everyone, we financially support the nonprofit Internet Security Research Group, ISRG, which operates the free automated open certificate authority known as Let's Encrypt. And Let's Encrypt provides TLS certificates to more than 225 million websites, thereby creating a more secure and privacy respecting web for all users. And we're delighted to see that from that work, we now have more than 80% of websites globally using HTTPS. And think about it, just five years ago, that figure was around 40%. We also financially support the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is the home of Internet Standards Development, where Internet engineers are working to enhance the security of existing Internet protocols, think of TLS 1.3, and to design new protocols with strong encryption and metadata protection as a default. And here you can think of QUIC. 
this is a privacy conference. So I don't need to tell you that people care deeply about their, the confidentiality of their um, communications. Let's just look at the recent mass migration from WhatsApp to Signal and Telegram. So for our discussion today, a starting premise we hope that everyone agrees with is that in an open representative democracy, it's okay and necessary to keep secrets, not only from companies, but also from government. And also in open societies, we accept some limits on detecting bad people doing bad things because we don't wanna live in a panopticon. Laws that target encryption are an attack on privacy and everyone's digital security. If you talk to industry experts, they will tell you that you can have a system that's secure by design or one that has a, a backdoor built in, not both. It's that binary concept that Scott was talking about. Criminals like built-in backdoors. It gives them another way in to steal personal data, government secrets, intellectual property, and other valuable information. And, and we shouldn't help them by requiring or even encouraging companies to weaken their systems. And if there are backdoors in commonly used systems, criminals will just go to the back, black market or build their own. So really, simply, we shouldn't compromise the security of devices and, and services that millions or billions of people rely on every day. Now, to the question of the debate, you know, if there was, uh, you know, an obvious or easy answer, someone would have found it by now. So I think Scott described it as being stuck. I, I would say we're in a stalemate. And, and the only way out in a stalemate is to look at things differently. So let's start by acknowledging that access is already happening. That's what Susan said. She said, you know, law enforcement, and I'm going to say even schools, yes, schools are breaking into devices and communications with hacking tools from companies like Celebrite. And in the EU last year and late towards the end, Europol launched what they called an innovative decryption platform specifically for this purpose. So some people call this uh, circumventing encryption, but it's basically hacking by government. And, you know, fully bug free, vulnerability free software is the holy grail of software developers. But just because there might be ways in doesn't mean it's fair game. Um, there are many examples of what can go wrong when governments try to get access by exploiting weaknesses in software. And because so much attention has been devoted to the debate about adding exceptional access mechanisms, existing government hacking practices are not getting the scrutiny they should. You know, where is the oversight? Why aren't we talking about the dangers of this access? So instead of prolonging the stalemate, I'm going to suggest we focus on making sure existing ways that law enforcement is using to gain access, like by hacking, don't pose a risk to the security of internet users, critical systems, and the internet. Thank you, Christian. Thank you so much. Uh, as a law enforcement representative, I, I, I should just maybe uh, add that I, I'm not sure I, I completely agree that there's a, a parallel between uh, lawful access, even if you call it hacking, for most often uh, provided uh, on the basis of a warrant issued by a court in, a, in accordance with with due process and then a, a, an actual hacker, uh, but um, I think that is that it still goes to the key of the uh, or the heart of the matter. How do we actually do this uh, in practice? Uh, so one of the people that may have some influence on that, or may know some people at least, uh, is uh, is Catherine Bauer, uh, both from the Commission. Uh, I already uh, put her in a tight spot by saying she must know what what the solution is because it seems like the Commission is hinting at it in this latest proposal. But um, now I'll let her speak for herself. Catherine. Yes, thank you, Christian, and thank you for, for already quoting the European Commission position that saves me a couple of precious seconds of speaking time. I think as you can tell from this um, from this statement in the NIS proposal, it is very clear that um, we are we are not yet providing the solution. And um, I'll go a little bit into our thinking around this now. But just to, to emphasize a point you already made about the Europol platform, which in fact has existed since 2013 and provides support for lawful orders uh, from member states when it comes to uh, accessing devices. So I would agree with you that um, 
this, uh, this is something that always needs to be, of course, based on a lawful order under member state law, or complying with EU law and the Charter. Um, so, indeed, um, calling it hacking may be a bit misleading. Um, so, uh, as our most recent proposal emphasizes, um, for the European Commission, encryption plays a key role in ensuring cybersecurity and in preserving the privacy and data protection of citizens. But at the same time, encryption is also used by criminals to hide their crimes and to communicate in secrecy. And that has indeed, as others have highlighted, made the work of law enforcement and the judiciary more challenging as they seek to gain lawful access to evidence. Member states have reported that as much as 75% of their cases are affected by encryption. And as Susan highlighted, law enforcement may have some success when they actually have a device in hand, but actually detecting the crime and identifying the individual remains very challenging. So the EU member states and also, in the, Euro also the European Commission are in the sometimes unenviable position of needing to bring these different principles and interests into um, what we call practical concordance. Um, so this is the, the process of reconciling different fundamental rights and um, interests of the states where no one right can always prevail over the other and they have to be brought into balance with each other. Um, so from the perspective of the governments, as Scott already highlighted, that there is no point in absolutist positions. We can neither ban encryption nor can we ban access that we would consider lawful under our EU key, including the charger. And here, indeed, we, we run up against a wholly, <laughs> not new problem, but um, a different problem in for legislators um, when it comes to end-to-end -end encryption. Um, it's often compared to the right to lock your door. However, even when you lock your door, normally you can still conduct a house search based on a lawful order and break down the door if needed. When you're offering end-to-end -end encryption in that sense, you could compare it to somebody providing everyone with a free unbreakable door precluding house searches from the outset. So the traditional balancing exercise that governments are used to cannot just be transferred into this context. Um, so we need to find the proper approach of that for encryption and move away from binary approaches even when it comes to um, what looks like a binary case. Um, others were citing finance and banking um, as being in need of strong encryption for economic purposes. And I just note that financial institutions still manage to comply with money laundering laws and nonetheless maintain security with appropriate levels of encryption. Um, so what does all that mean in practice for making policy on this? First, um, our position as the Commission is that little can be gained by talking about encryption as an abstract concept because there are many different forms of encryption. Just here today, people were citing uh, HTTPS, uh, encryption on the device, and uh, the main topic here today is end-to-end -end encryption. All those forms of encryption present specific advantages and challenges. So I really welcome the specificity of this panel on the focusing on the end-to-end -end encryption. Um, for encryption, the Commission has elaborated a set of considerations that we hope can be used to create a common ground and a foundation upon which progress can be made on this work. Um, and I just want to share seven points from those um, considerations with you um, that might be uh, interesting also to stimulate the further debate. First, our position is that orders to access encrypted communications must always be targeted, proportionate, and validated by a judiciary authority. Secondly, the Commission um, asks for a transparent reporting procedures as well as appropriate review and redress mechanisms. So in practice, the, the person who is affected must at some point know about the measure and must have a possibility to contest this measure. Third, we will not support technical solutions that will constitute a weakening or banning of encryption. Fourth, technical solutions to access encrypted information should only be used when necessary. That is where they're effective and where other less intrusive means are not available. Um, one famous example that is often cited is situations where the criminal um, is caught in the in the process of accessing, um, for example, a, a dark web space. 
um, so that you don't actually have to break the encryption in order to get access to the um, otherwise encrypted information. Um, there is one other alternative that is frequently cited, which is the analysis of metadata and the potential that that might hold. Um, from the EU perspective, we, we view this with some caution because, of course, um, the Court of Justice of the European Union has clarified several times over that the analysis of metadata, at least when processed in bulk, deserves protection similar to that um, that applied to content. So it's not necessarily the best alternative uh, from our perspective, but we could perhaps get into that into the in the discussion. Fifth principle is that the transmission of data to law enforcement authorities should always benefit from state-of-the-art security measures to comply with data protection rules. Um, sixth, given the the broad spectrum of possible encryption solutions, in the opinion of the Commission services, there should be no single prescribed technical solution to provide access to encrypted data, um, which is in keeping with our principle of technological neutrality and goes some way towards explaining why in the, in the NIST preamble we have not gone into more detail on this. Uh, so clearly there is no one silver bullet and companies providing the encryption for their products um, can of course contribute to identifying the best solutions. And seventh and finally, um, we need industry, civil society and academia support, as well as independent expert advice uh, that is indispensable and therefore discussions such as this one today and also um, the Carnegie process that Susan was earlier referring to are really um, priceless in terms of getting input to the legislators. And the, the discussions we're having here, but also work that is being done elsewhere, is key to inform the legislators and to contribute to a sophistication of the debate, which is necessary in order to find solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, and, and thank you for bringing us down the road of, of looking into some form of solutions uh, to this issue. And 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 I would like to 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 take that and ask the, the rest of the panel to to uh, give us their, their views on, on those specific seven points, but also maybe first to go um, to go via Scott and, 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 and ask you if you could give us a, a quick uh, crash course into the concept of key escrow as a possible solution. Um, and, and then I would like to hear the other panelists take on, on that as, as some form of middle ground uh, pros and cons. But, but Scott, could you, could you uh, give us a, a, a brief insight into what, what that concept means? So absolutely. So when you encrypt uh, data or communications, you need a key, a special code to be able to un uh, decrypt it. And the theory behind key escrow is that when someone uh, encrypts data, the key necessary to decrypt it is stored with a third party, uh, someone who's trusted. And so uh, it is essentially escrowed with a third party so that the government can go to that third party and get the key. And I would point out that it's an important concept, not just in the context of law enforcement access, but in fact, uh, many organizations escrow keys and individuals escrow keys. And they do that because they need uh, to recover their data. You know, when we were having the original encryption debate in the 90s, I was invited by a drug manufacturing company to come talk on a panel about key escrow. And at the time I was surprised because only law enforcement was talking about escrowing keys. And when I asked him why this was a focus of a panel they were doing at a conference, he said, we spend a ton of money to develop drugs. And there are people who wanna steal these formulas. So we of course encrypt them. But if the employee who encrypts that uh, formula gets hit by a bus, we need a way to get our data back. So in fact, a lot of products have key escrow built into them. The question though, is who gets to decide whether they wanna use that feature or not. And in current products, it's the user of the product who gets to decide. But it is not that everything is fully encrypted um, without key escrow or plain text. Sometimes things are encrypted and keys are escrowed for business reasons. And what is your what is your uh, view on on that as a, as a possible solution? Because as I see it, at the end of the day, when you use and rely on end-to-end -end encryption, 
the trust is involved no matter what. You are trusting that the provider, the vendor, uh, be it Google, Microsoft, whoever, is actually encrypting and is actually uh, doing an adequate job at encrypting. So there's always going to be trust involved. Here, trust is just that the assurances they give that only a valid legal request uh, will be will be will be honored with uh, access to 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 data via a third party it could be a law firm or some other uh, entity that is that is clearly identified. It could it could be a civil uh, uh, a civil rights organization, uh, whoever you may want to to use as a, a third party. So the first thing is that if you're using end to end encryption, you want to be sure that the algorithm uh, and the implementation are secure. So if you if you think about Signal, for example, that's open sourced and you know what the algorithm is, it's been vetted. Uh, that's a really important aspect. You bring up an, a, a quite important issue. Uh, when Scott and I were thinking about uh, encrypted data back in the 1990s, that was when the Clipper chip was announced and the National Academies did a report on encryption policy after our report. And one of the things they said was, if you want to try an escrowed system, and the Clipper chip was an escrowed system, the keys were going to be escrowed with two agencies of the U.S. government, which was something that Europe was not thrilled about. And the report, the National Academies report said, if you want to try and do an uh, escrowed system, then first implement it and try it at scale, not at scale of 100,000 people, but at the scale of millions running all the time and see how well it works and see how secure it is. And that was never done. Um, escrowed encryption is hard to do and to do securely, it's hard. Um, and to do it in an environment that is a public environment where you're creating a really rich source for an adversary to go after. So an interesting aspect of, of this kind of threat is that when Google was wiretapping some of its users under court order um, by the US government, the database that included who was being tapped was accessed by the Chinese government. Now, why would the Chinese government care who was being tapped in the United States? Well, it told them who was of interest to the US government, which of their operatives had been uncovered. And that's the point. When you create an escrowed system, you've created a rich, ripe source of a place to go after data. Um, I want to end by quoting a friend of mine who worked for the National Security Agency. And he said to me, you know, when we get a court order that gives us permission to go after the data, but there's nothing in the court order that says it will be easy to do so. And that's the issue we're really discussing. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I think that that last point is is a crucial uh, crucial aspect as well because yes, it's true as has been mentioned by other panelists that that uh, today, even though there is encryption, uh, access still happens. But uh, I think the issue, at least for regular law enforcement that may not have the resources of the NSA, um, the fact that this is a gradually uh, wider and and more difficult problem to solve in the individual case. Uh, just a day to day investigation is now being confronted with this issue. It just means that it it is de facto impossible uh, to do that. Even if you could apply the full resources of the government, you could actually break the encryption. But in in the day to day workings of many law enforcement, it's it's actually becoming a resource issue that means that you are blocked from accessing data, depending on the circumstances. Um, but I also want, I want to move on to, um, oh, sorry, I'm oh, sorry, I'm sorry, um, I mean, the, the audio was gone. Uh, I just wanted to, to, uh, I'll just repeat that. I said that the, the point that Susan made, I think was, was, uh, was very important that, um, you need to have a, uh, a, a balanced approach to um, to this issue, uh, but I also want to let the other panelists uh, interject. So, uh, uh, Christine, do you want to uh, to give your views on, or maybe on a on a key escrow issue, uh, or the the wider points made by by Craven on how the Commission is approaching this area? Thank you, Christian. So, on the key escrow point, I'm going to point everyone to to the experts and point everyone to the keys under doormat report, and basically. Um, 
as part of that report, you know, key escrow was considered. And, and my understanding is, you know, from the experts that there's just no safe way to do it. And that's why we don't see it. But I really like to pick up on the, the points that were made by uh, Kathleen uh, about the, the principles. I think there were some really excellent principles and some things that I think perhaps were incorporated, but might, but or could be added is to think about, uh, first of all, you know, the, the context, you know, are we going to be using this um, in all cases or, or should we only be thinking about this when it can be demonstrated that it's needed to protect human life, to counter imminent and significant risks to public safety, to prevent the most serious of crimes, a sort of a last resort when there is no other viable alternative uh, available. And I think uh, one of the other things that would be useful is to do some kind of risk mitig mitigation and impact assessment before even starting down the path of, of wanting to get access, making sure that there's going to be no foreseeable risk of damage or harm to other or harm to the security of other users and and making sure that these sorts of assessments and criteria are developed as Katrine said with um, you know experts from all backgrounds excellent before i turn over to uh, to you Catherine, uh, i just want to flag that we have a question from the audience um which is uh, let's start off with the one from uh, yes balloon he asks how would the commission apply the principle of technological neutrality if no technical solution exists that will allow for exceptional access to data or communications by law enforcement without creating backdoors so uh cutting to the heart of the matter um uh, but uh, but but i'll leave it the floor to you Catherine. Yes, uh, thank you, Christian. And if I may, um, maybe I'll respond to Christine first, because indeed, um, under EU law already, we have the requirement of necessity and proportionality, which is that in any case um, where you go before a judge to get an order, for example, to access encrypted data, you would need to show that there are no easier means that are less privacy invasive to obtain the same data. And it has to be proportionate. So if you're doing it for bicycle theft, you're not going to have a lot of success, I think that's safe to say. And I, I really, I mean, the, the impact assessment idea is is great. I mean, I think it's it's inherent for each individual order in um, in this requirement to prove necessity and proportionality, but also horizontally, when we look for solutions, we should be conducting exactly that impact assessment. And that requires also looking at the alternatives to accessing encrypted information. Um, we've already discussed a couple of them. You can uh, try to access the device if you have it in hand. A solution that's also employed is to access the device remotely so that you are in essence, um, and it's, it's, it's permitted in some member states for, for combating serious crimes. You can basically um, install a, a Trojan on, on a device that um, can share information on what is being shared on the device. And that can basically access communications data before the end-to-end -end encryption is employed. Um, and that, of course, gives law enforcement access to the entire device and everything that happens on it and prevents uh, a priori any kind of targeted access, which would then need to be employed um, when filtering the data that is uh, basically sought from the device. Um, you can also employ more pervasive um, surveillance of the individual. So you can follow them around, you can install bugs and try and snoop uh, and, and figure out the passwords to get access to the conversation. Um, and there are other means to deal with these issues. Um, I, I referenced earlier this issue of, of metadata analysis. Um, and I think it's quite interesting to look at this uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, so we see uh, one area where we where we know a lot about um, the, the basic uh, effect of of detecting illegal content is in the fight against child sexual abuse, where a lot of companies have taken measures to detect child sexual abuse that's being shared on their platforms. Um, and there is one company that offers um, a messaging service that, as of now, is not 
that's end-to-end -end encrypted, and a second messaging service that is end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, that company seeks to detect the sharing of child sexual abuse um, on both channels, of course, um, and on one of them necessarily just by looking at the metadata. Um, the company under US law has to share um, any detected child sexual abuse with law with an NGO that then shares it with law enforcement. And um, we had 12 million reports from the non-encrypted channel of child sexual abuse that was shared with a total of over 50, 50 million images. From the end-to-end -end encrypted channel, as you would expect, um, there were thousands of notifications, so less than 0.3%. Uh, I think that speaks to the effectiveness um, of actually detecting serious crimes on online services when we're dealing with end-to-end -end encrypted environments, and at least for now, the effectiveness of alternative solutions. And um, indeed, if we had uh, to the technological neutrality question, um, we really look at it in a wider context. So. The Commission is looking not only for solutions that would target end-to-end -end encryption per se, but also, of course, for other solutions around that that could pro prove similarly effective. And that's where the concept of technological neutrality comes in. Excellent. Thank you. I also want to want to pass over to, to Susan to uh, to respond to, uh, to your comments. Thank you. I had a couple of comments, Catherine. One is that while um, lawful hacking, putting Trojans on a remote device are perf is a perfectly reasonable solution now when a phone is insecure, but as a long-term solution, we would hope to see mobile devices and any device that anybody uses as being secure. Because if we legislate any type of requirement that says that a, de a remote device has to be open to that kind of hacking by law enforcement, of course, what we're enabling is mass surveillance. I'm not saying that a particular European government would do it, but by creating technology in that way, there's that that risk. That's one of the reasons that the, that's the reason the Carnegie Committee explicitly said, we want the device in hand. Any solution that gets legislated must require the device in hand. The other about, um, about child porn, it's always an incredibly difficult topic to talk about. Uh, there's, uh, it's, it's just horrible and ugly and the crimes are getting worse. Um, that said, I know that in the United States, the number of crimes or potential crimes reported by the tech companies to law enforcement is not, those are not investigated. Most of the, many of those are not investigated. Um, the leads are not followed up. Uh, it's, it's easy to think we should go after everybody involved in child porn, the consumers and the producers. And the consumers typically have less protection on their devices. But, and, but while the consumers use the, the horrible stuff and prop up a horrid, horrid industry, it's the producers that are the ones that we want to go after. And it's much like organized crime investigations of the 1980s and 1990s. By the 1990s, organized crime got off telephones because they knew about the wiretapping and they didn't feel secure. And what law enforcement had to do was bug places if they wanted communications between the bad guys. Now that's much harder to do and much more dangerous. Um, but in the same way, we have to go after the bad guys in the child porn center, in the child porn situation, by really going after the producers. And, and uh, while end-to-end -end encryption has a role there, so do many other things as well. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I, I think you make a valid, valid point, Susan. I would say, from the point of law enforcement office, I think the the difference between maybe organized crime uh, um, back in the eighties and nineties is that now, obviously, we are confronted with the jurisdictional issues that are created by the internet, and and often the producers of of child pornographic materials are nowhere near, for instance, Danish jurisdictional reach. They're in the Philippines or or in Thailand. Uh, and uh, an effective investigation is, is is very difficult. What would you what would you say to that point? That that just bugging the room of someone in a completely different country that is that is performing or or, or servicing someone requesting uh, child abuse uh, images uh, is not is not quite as simple as as uh, finding the the mafia holdout. Well, you know, in some senses, um, it it is actually a great deal simpler. Uh, it's 
pretty hard to put that bug in the room. On the other hand, someone who's producing child porn in the Philippines and shipping real-time uh, child porn to somebody in Denmark has a communication portrait um, of data transvers transversing one way and not another that's quite interesting. Um, and that can be a way to pick them up that's a whole lot easier for law enforcement to do than placing that bug in 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 organized crime hideout. That said, you need the laws um, and treaty agreement in order to allow uh, prosecution, and that's a different kind of. Problem. Yes, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, right, I want to to uh, pick up on one more of the questions and and put that to uh, to to uh, Christine and to uh, to Scott. Um, the question uh, goes uh, as follows: um, Is the is the issue at hand basically one of of training of law enforcement rather than one of technical solutions? Uh, so basically, is is this a uh, an issue that also needs to be addressed through raising uh, the level of competence uh, within law enforcement uh, as a general point? Christian, um, you want to you want to lead us off? I'd be happy to, um, but let me first qualify my comments with I'm, I'm not in the in the police force, I'm not in law enforcement, so I, I don't have inside knowledge of the level of training, but uh, let's face it, the com computers are hard for everyone. So um, just as uh, we all need to use uh, how to use computers in our personal life, um, there's, there's obviously an ongoing need for law enforcement officers who are involved in uh, investigations that uh, involve digital evidence to have the skills not only to know what to look for, but how to preserve that evidence, um, how to do um, the digital forensics that are needed, um, how to explain it to judges so they understand it. There's, there's a lot of considerations that, that take into account. And actually, I mean, Europol in the EU has the Cirrus project, which is a sort of a platform that's um, designed to do that. It has um, trainings, it has a, a sort of a, a platform for information sharing and, and other tools like that. Um, there is, as we've touched upon a, a lot, already, there are a wide range of access choices that law enforcement already have. I mean, more and more of our activities are digitized, recorded, analyzed more than ever before. I mean, we have sensors in our homes, our bedrooms, our boardrooms. Um, there in the US, there are uh, I, I was shocked to learn about all these vast surveillance net of ring internet connected smart doorbells that are, are paired with the social media app uh, and a direct partnership with law enforcement that allows direct access to users to get video um, surveillance. Um, and there are cloud backups, there's um, already unencrypted content, open source intelligence, citizen reports, uh, access through witnesses, metadata, which Catherine uh, spoke about. So there's a lot of um, avenues for improving the use of what's available. Right. Excellent, thank you. Uh, uh, Scott, I'll, I'll leave it over to you. So the, the, the question was, is this basically a problem of regulation or is it more one of education and training of law enforcement agencies? Well, it, there's definitely a need for training. I think the important thing to think about is who's getting trained to do what so that you can respond on the scale that's required. So um, in a world where everyone has a cell phone or electronic device, the idea that you're going to train every law enforcement expert to be a forensics expert is a non-starter for me. Um, and as, so as a co-author of the original U.S. federal guidelines on searching and seizing computers, we concluded that different law enforcement agents needed different levels of training so that collectively they could be effective. So, for example, a police officer in the field who's seizing a phone 
needs to know how to preserve that evidence, ensure that uh, the suspect is not deleting data, et cetera, and that's preserved in a way that will maintain chain of custody to get it into a court of law. Having said that, you are not going to train every police officer on the street to become a digital forensics expert. You're going to have a higher level of expertise in forensics labs. So the challenge for government, as in so many things with the internet, is the question of scale. How do we, with the resources we have, make sure that we have the throughput to deal with the quantity of data we're getting. I mean, I, I can certainly tell you from my experience in the early years, um, as the computer revolution took hold, the FBI was just overwhelmed with data. I mean, every case led to the seizure of a computer that ended up in a forensics lab with them just stacked against the wall as forensic analysis was going on as quickly as they could. Um, so. Scale is important, and you need to have the right person doing the right thing. Thank you. And I, I want to grab one more question from uh, from our audience, uh, which is addressed to the uh, the commission. And then I would like to to close off with having all panelists uh, give us your take on where will we be in five years in regards to this dilemma. It has already been ongoing for for many years. Everything seems to be picking up. Uh, things need seems to be coming to some sort of head. But it, it's it's clearly unclear what the what the, the 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 end game will be, if you will, or or will will there be a technical solution, um, or we will just continue along this road. Uh, I will get back to you all on, on on that point. But first of all, the question to the commission is uh, uh, to to Catherine: Will the commission propose to oblige communication service providers to search all private messages for alleged uh, um, child exploitative material? Or will this obligation extend to um, and will this obligation extend to end-to-end -end encrypted communications, or can this be ruled out? So, um, a direct question to to you, Catherine. Yes, thank you. And I can just say that um, we have announced, indeed, in the um, communication on a more effective fight against child sexual abuse last summer that we're looking into an obligation to detect known child sexual abuse materials. Um, we have to further define this obligation. And for this, we are currently undergoing the wonderful process called an impact assessment. And um, based on the outcomes of this, uh, the political level will then decide on the way forward. So I cannot, at this point, commit to anything or rule out anything. Fair enough. Spoken like a true professional. Um, uh, right, so I will just quickly ask all panelists to to just give us uh, three minutes of your thoughts on where where will we be uh, five, maybe seven years down the road. Uh, what is what is your projection if, if, as I put you on the spot? Uh, Susan, can we start off uh, with you, please? I have to start with somebody else. Okay, um, will um, there are two scenarios? The rosy scenario is that we answer the questions that Catherine and that Scott raised, um, and how do we supply law enforcement with capabilities? And, and it's, it's inherent in Scott's answer, so I'm gonna steal Scott's thunder there, where um, you have different levels of expertise, and maybe, for example, in the US, there's expertise at the federal level. That doesn't mean they conduct the investigation. That means they have technical capabilities that they can share with state and local. Um, and you take care of the problem that way. The bleak scenario is the scenario where we put restrictions on crypto and maybe we're better able to investigate uh, child porn uh, crimes, uh, but we find an explosion of other types of crimes as cyber criminals go after data that used to be hard to get. So if we go back to the rosy scenario, we also want solutions of the sort that you were asking for, Christian. You were saying, what if the data, you know, here I have the consumer in, in Denmark, the producer is in the Philippines. Well, we want better solutions that way too. So it's not just better capability sharing, but we also want the ability to capture the, cr the criminal when they're somewhere else. Now, sometimes we're never gonna be able to do that. We know that, that certain countries use non-state actors to conduct 
uh, what we can either call national na nation state attacks or criminal activity. And those nation states are never going to give up uh, their criminals in that situation, but they might give them up when they're doing child porn. And, and right. so those are my two scenarios. Right. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Christine, let's, uh, let's, let's turn to you. Uh, what do you see in your crystal ball? Ah, yes. What do I see in, in my, my crystal ball? Well, first of all, uh, it's, we're already at the sort of five year mark post Snowden. A lot's happened in five years. It might seem like we're having the same conversation we were five years ago, but it's subtly changed and we don't have enough time to go into that. In five years time, I think one of the things I, we will see is encryption more and more ubiquitous and probably um, a lot more end-to-end -end encryption, a lot more user-controlled encryption as well. Uh, better security, I hope, for IoT. <laughs> um, then I, I think um, what we will see is hopefully uh, law enforcement Yes, I'll, I'll finish up. Law enforcement agencies that are, are better equipped to do di digital evidence, digital forensics. Um, I think um, I think we will still be having these conversations in five years time. Uh, one of the things that will be interesting is, however, I, I would hope that with increased use of ubiquitous encryption, we will see a really rapid and significant drop in data breaches, identity theft and other um, other crimes that are affecting people every day. And the thing we need to watch out for, though, is some kind of digital black swan event, which Susan kind of alluded to. Thank you. Exciting, a black swan event. Looking forward to that. Scott, can we uh, can we have your insights, please, on, on where you see us in, in five years' time? Um, I see us having this same panel, and I'd be happy to participate. Yeah. Um, I think... If, I think the problem is in part that it's very hard to quantify the impact of any decision. So we say, well, you know, if there's law enforcement access through Kiesco, how much risk does that add? The answer is we really can't quantify it. If we say that if you have a Kiesco system, criminals will download unbreakable crypto off the internet and avoid the system, how many, what percentage of criminals will do that? We actually don't know. You know. And so when you can't quantify the variables, it's very hard to reach a policy decision. I agree there'll be more and more encryption and we need that to protect security and to protect privacy. And I think law enforcement needs to be more effective in dealing in an encrypted world. Excellent. And uh, finally, we turn to uh, to Catherine, please. Yes, and, and Scott, I think, had the perfect transition there. Indeed, uh, law enforcement will have to cope and will become hopefully more competent. And we've seen, as, as was alluded to in the beginning, that this debate has raged on for 20 years. And and still somehow we're finding ways to tackle crime. Um, and I hope we will continue to do so in the future. For us, in any case, given that access to end-to-end -end encrypted or any encrypted information is really a measure of, of last resort when there are easier and less invasive means are available. For us, this is really just a piece of a puzzle that's broader. And um, Christina already alluded to the serious platform. We're, we're investing a lot in building capability of law enforcement in training the right people in creating forensic standards that uh, might mean that evidence collected in one member state can also be used before the courts in another member state. We have put forward proposals to speed up judicial cooperation between the member states, but also with third country providers, the e-evidence proposals. Um, and we have been hosting exchanges with industry and civil society to make sure that we have a possibility to gain insights from those who might be very well placed to advise on, on their specific piece of the puzzle. Um, and that's really where I see um, this going, that we will continue to look at a bouquet of possible uh, approaches to this. And I also, like Scott, think that in five years, we will still be discussing these issues in whatever form they have evolved to. This is clearly not going to go away. 
um, but it remains a fascinating topic. So I'm very grateful to be part of this discussion today. Well, I think that we can conclude that the panel has had the best possible outcome in that we've all agreed to come back in five years time and do it again in real life in Brussels uh, with actual coffee and actual beer um, uh, uh, together. Uh, I think I'm just we're at the end of, uh, of, of time almost. I'm just going to take this opportunity to thank everyone in the panel and thank everyone in the audience uh, for their questions and participation. Uh, I think it is it is safe to say we will definitely keep talking. I think uh, uh, gave a, a Catherine gave a very good um, uh, sort of image. Uh, there's a bouquet of, of of options of challenges as we go forward. Uh, this is not over yet. Uh, I know for sure that law enforcement is, is engaged on these issues going forward. And I know also that everyone else on, on the other side, not that we need to be looking at us as different sides, uh, is, is also um, adamant in, in ensuring uh, that uh, that communication can still be encrypted. Um, so hopefully I will see you, uh, all four of you, and also everyone in the audience um, in, uh, in five years time. Thank you so much for, for your time and, and for joining us today. Uh, both to you and to everyone in the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.